Well, I'm here to talk primarily about what the DCNR is doing for trout on state forest land, and uh, we cooperate very closely with the other agencies within DCNR. I represent the Bureau of Forestry, but uh, I, I can tell you that Parks is also doing a lot of great stuff. So primarily, I'm here to talk about the Brook Trout Conservation Plan, and especially the additions that we have from the recent revision. So the, the other topics that we're going to touch on, other than the Brook Trout Conservation Plan, are going to be topics such as the Hemlock Conservation Plan, and all of these pertain to, to the health of streams on which trout rely. So the, the Hemlock Conservation Plan, the Aquatic Habitat Buffer Guidelines, the Pipeline Stream Crossing BMPs, and we're really great at developing documents with really long names, the uh, State Forest Resource Management Plan, and the Secretary's Water Initiative, And nobody in the back can read this, but the important stuff is in red for this talk, at least for the, for the sake of trout, is ecosystem management, biological diversity, clean water, habitats, and one that I should have put in red that I just realized, low density recreation. And that's especially important when we can see with the next slide. I only put class A streams on state forest land. You can see a concentration of them right there. If I were to put all wild trout streams, uh, you wouldn't see green for state forest land, you would just see blue. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to let you know that one of the reasons why I think it's important for us to be doing what we're doing for trout streams is we manage 2.2 million acres of, of public land, and that includes a lot of trout streams. And that, what I would like to make sure that everybody in here is, uh, has a clear understanding of is this, this is your land. So all those opportunities, you should be out there and enjoying recreation on state forest land. And if you're really ambitious, I would encourage you to stop by a district office and fill out a comment card to let them know that you're there to fish. I could use all the support like that I can get. <laughs> all right, so into the Brook Trout Conservation Plan. It was originally written in 2010. That was, uh, I think, in, in response to the uh, Fish and Boat Commission came out with a plan. Well, with their revision of their plan, then we revised our plan to reflect some of their changes. And I took it upon myself to add uh, some of the initiatives that I, I was really trying to push. So we have the uh, culvert assessments and BMPs in there, along with uh, improving habitat on a more uh, proactive uh, approach. This was on the Bureau of Forestry website. I hope it still is. I just want to let everybody know that it's a brand new Bureau of Forestry website, so I don't know where it's located. It might be easier just to Google uh, DCNR uh, Trout Conservation Plan. So the contents, and I'm not going to discuss all of this in detail, but the contents goes over well, why, why does the DCNR even care about brook trout? It's because it's the right thing to do. A little bit of history about, uh, about brook trout, the aquatic classifications, which we've already discussed earlier today, and how that uh, affects how we can protect those streams, and then some of the uh, existing guidelines that we have that the Bureau already follows. The other sections of it include the uh, stressor, stressors and conservation measures. And some of these include uh, like land management decisions, increasing water temperatures, introduced species, you can read the list there, sedimentation, erosion, pollutants. And one of the things I'd like to stress here is uh, the Bureau of Forestry is a FSC certified forest stewardship forest. I don't remember right now because I'm up on, on a microphone. But, <laughs> but we're, we're certified where it's well-managed forests. And, uh, by doing that, that really we're doing a good job of managing forests, and, and part of that there are criteria that we're minimizing any type of impacts we have on the aquatic resources. The stressors that I would like to focus on, because these are the revisions that we just put into the revised trout plan, are going to be the, the in-stream habitat and the aquatic connectivity. So first, even though it's issue number seven, I would like to address this first, is the barriers to fish passage. What we're doing is we're cooperating very closely, especially with Trout Unlimited, to try to get some, uh, some training organized 
and hopefully get some of these assessments done on state forest land by bureau personnel. Along with that, I, I don't want to wait until the assessments are done to actually do something about some of these because we're replacing culverts as they either fail or we're installing new culverts for new infrastructure. So we went ahead and developed some BMPs to make sure that every new culvert from this point forward should be a, a, a good culvert for organism passage. And the main, the main problems we saw with the historic culverts, and keep in mind that a lot of our culverts were done uh, very, very far in the past where a lot of these issues weren't, weren't a concern for the people installing these. Uh, some of them are CCC culverts that I'm sure this guidance wasn't out there. But our two main concerns were they were sized uh, perhaps too small or they were installed incorrectly, not embedded. So those are the two main uh, issues that we addressed with the BMPs. And our engineering bureau, because the DCNR is made up of a, quite a few bureaus, the engineering bureau adopted these because they're the actual people that design our stream crossings. So now I'm going to talk about the lack of in-stream habitat and what we're doing about that. Uh, as Tyler mentioned, we were the same way. We, we did everything as a, like a shotgun approach, very opportunistic. It required a district to want to participate, and it also required partners. So in the past, it was usually Trout Unlimited that came to a district and said, hey, we want to do a habitat improvement on this stream. And we did it, and that's great. Uh, the, unfortunately, it wasn't very uh, efficient, and it wasn't very proactive. So thanks to the Fish and Boat Commission, we're incorporating the prioritization tool. One of the things that we're doing, instead of just doing uh, some of the uh, traditional engineered structures, is we're doing a, what a lot of people call the chop and drop method. So we're cutting trees into the stream, adding woody debris. And we've piloted this in two locations. So anybody that's down around the Michaud in South Central, you can go to Mountain Creek and see some of the work we've done. People up in Potter County, they can go to the West Branch of the Germania and see some of the work we've done up there. Next year, we already have, uh, I think, seven projects total on, on the list, and a uh, pending permit, we're going to do a lot of good work next year. The really incredible thing about this is I expected two years before we would see results on, on some of this habitat improvement. I, I thought it would take two years of high flows in order to get the scour and everything that we needed. Within two months, we had scour pools, we had leaf pack, we had a diversity of habitat. We had a little bit of backwater area developed. We we took stream channels from being wide and shallow with no or uniform habitat to a really diverse habitat and exposed a lot of substrate. And if anybody's familiar with Mountain Creek and the Michaud, they'll tell you that it's mostly sand bottom with some cobble, not not much gravel. Now we have gravel in there. And as I already mentioned, we're, we're really partnering with the, the Fish and Boat Commission with the prioritization, and I'm very, very thankful for that. And right here is a, is a topic that I did not expect to have the, uh, the impacts that we did on, on the floodplains when we did this woody material addition. And the significance of this, I, I think, uh, it, I can't even explain how happy I was to, to see what we saw. We're so used to seeing streams that are either incised or separated from the floodplain that when floods actually do reach the floodplain, as they do now that we did this habitat, now I hear from people, wow, now that you did that, you're flooding. You know, isn't that bad? No, that's great. That's, that's the whole purpose of a floodplain. So we're restoring the hydrology of the floodplain. We're eventually, we'll have a lower peak flows higher base flow because if we're allowing flood water on the flood plain, we're allowing infiltration. So we're going to have higher base flow in between precipitation events. We're going to have positive wetland impacts and I'm, I'm hoping to be able to prove that by doing soil test pits and some wetland uh, sampling. And another topic that I don't really like to talk about because it doesn't make me happy is the hemlock woolly adelgid. And this is a it's an exotic pest that kills hemlock trees, and that's especially important to trout streams because as everybody here that fishes knows, there, there's hemlock along a lot of our trout streams. And as you can tell, it's just about everywhere. In response to this, 
we're trying to explore what options we have. And, and really, it, it's quite limited. We can treat, we can chemically treat with pesticides. That's, that's really expensive. You can only treat so much. I just hit a button. So you can only treat so much on a, a given acre before you exceed standards of uh, pesticide application. We have biocontrols, and re currently we're releasing a beetle that is successful as far as you can recapture it, which means they're surviving, which also means they're eating hemlock woolly adelgid. As far as success as how are they reducing hemlock woolly adelgid, we don't really have a, a, a lot of data to, to show like we're really doing a great job with this. I would say the fact though that we are recollecting them means that we're, we're having an impact on them. The promising thing is there's other states around us that have a, a other biocontrols such as Silverfly that look very, very promising and our Division of Forest Health is exploring that currently. Another thing that the Division of Forest Health is uh, exploring is resistant hemlock. There's res a, a few patches of resistant hemlock that we're hopefully going to get some stock from. The, the thing to remember is hemlock is slow growing and it's going to take a while before that's going to be available to underplant out in the districts. But until then, we can still underplant with native species. And I, I'm a very big advocate of this. I, I don't want to see our hemlock stands decline and then have to do a reactive approach. I would rather get in there and have a proactive approach. Well, the Aquatic Habitat Buffer Guidelines, I get asked quite often, they're still being revised. Hopefully by the end of this year, they're, they're going to be completed. And what the, the main things that we're trying to revise are both the buffer width and to explain what is acceptable in there. Traditionally, the buffers have been uh, thought of as a hands-off type of area. And I would like to be able to say they're hands-off as far as detrimental impacts, as far as positive impacts. Let's get in there and do some good work in the buffers. And pipeline stream crossings. That's actually a, a, a nice pipeline right there uh, compared to uh, some that I, I think we saw pictures of earlier. But we put these together. We basically just compiled the guidance from uh, DEP, Fish and Boat Commission, and FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And with all that guidance put together, it, it's, we're doing the best that we can with, with any pipeline that we have crossing a stream. And many of you may be aware that we also just revised the State Forest Resource Management Plan. And one thing that I'm very happy about is we have some additions here. We added stuff about water, such as the whole the habitat and the aquatic organism passage. And that really benefits what I'm trying to do on state forest land and, and with parks. So this, to me, this, this was one of the best revisions that we've had. And I, I can't come up here and not talk about the Secretary's initiatives. The, the Secretary of the DCNR is uh, very active in, in trying to push uh, multiple initiatives, one of which is the, the water initiative. And with that, it, this isn't an all-inclusive list. This is the parts that I thought pertain directly to trout. We're addressing dam removal, culverts, habitat, and forest buffers. The Bureau of Forestry and DCNR as a whole uh, has a very limited uh, fishery staff. As such, we rely very, very heavily on partners. And if I left a partner off and you're in this room, I didn't mean to insult you. And the other thing is, since we do rely so heavily on partners, I would encourage anybody else to, uh, uh, I, I'm always looking for, for new partners. And with that, are there any questions? <laughs>